completely different way of um, environmental data um, from different places, completely different layers than we use for um, terrestrial. So, put your hands. How many people are working in the marine environment? One, two, three, <laughs> four. Good. Um, Seventy percent of the Earth's surface is represented by. Yeah, um, I'm used to that. Um, <laughs> it's it, it's worth um, demonstrating the complexity of the marine environment. But it is worth getting to think that there's more than just the welcome layers to do your um, modeling with. So, the um, marine layers, they, they, we can sort of group them into different categories in the same way that Rob was talking about. Um, we've got some topographic features, so um, asymmetry, CF, and um, what we can derive from um, CF data. We've got things directly measured from the water quality, so um, um, water chemistry. We've got oceanographic models, so uh, currents. Um, we've got some strata, so um, uh, what the seabed is made of, or it's rocky, it's not sediment, and what's there. And again, like the terrestrial um, environment, we've got human impact. And uh, they're, they're, they're sort of thematically what, what the data is. And then we also need to think about where that data comes from, how it's derived. So some of this data is interpolated mm -hmm. from direct measurements, equivalent to the, the World Twin Weather Stations. We've got um, uh, um, buoys, the correlation database, so we're constantly collecting temperature and water. We've got remote sense data, and we've got um, modeled data. So, marine environment is quite a different place to terrestrial, and the major complexity is we have to think in three dimensions rather than two. Um, when we're looking at terrestrial layers, we just think, okay, well, what's the temperature at the surface? Okay, but with um, with marine species, many many species will migrate vertically um, and spend time at the surface, in uh, water, depths, and uh, move between these, um, these regions. And obviously, um, these different places in the water column are very different environmentally. And we need to consider these differences in order to produce a, um, a, a sensible model. Um, so, I mean, uh, my perspective on this is that the, 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 these, these three dimensions make the, the marine environment much, much more difficult than the terrestrial environment, and so you, you land by you have got it easy. Um, I'm going to start by, with the topographic data, and uh, just as terrestrially, um, the, the, the sort of depth data equivalent to altitude is probably the best globally globally available data sets. So uh, there's this integrated elevation observatory model um, that's developed by GetCo and there's a different version called um, the Shuttle Radar Photography Mission SRTM, which basically takes the same data and um, and uses slightly different algorithms to produce a um, uh, global grid. Uh, um, the best data is at um, 30 half degrees, which is about one kilometer of the equator. Um, and this data is a combination of direct acoustic soundings and um, um, satellite-derived uh, gravity data, um, this, which is really cool. Um, the way that they um, estimate the uh, depth of the seabed is that they look at the height of the surface of the water and um, you get basically above a uh, mountain range the water is slightly higher. Just 
Uh, uh, but in, in order to, to use this sort of data, we need to understand what is used for building. Okay? So we've got this combination of two different data sources. Okay? Directly sensed acoustic data, so you're on a ship, you ping down to the seabed, and you get a um, really accurate measure of, of the depth. Okay? And then we compare that with satellite-based data that's based on the spot change in water elevation because of the gravity of the underlying surfaces. And uh, that is, you know, that is relatively coarse. So um, you know, the guy that makes the SRT on the grid um, told me that um, he, he thinks it's about three kilometers the inaccuracy on, uh, on the, the, the sort of resolution of the uh, gravity-based data compared to meter level resolution for the acoustic data. So incredibly different things that's compared together. So here's a question for you. Um, um, what proportion of global um, global uh, asymmetry data set is covered by acoustic data? Anyone want guess? Sorry? 90%. Yeah. 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 So this is a picture. The red <laughs> shows where there's uh, directly sample acoustic data. Um, this is about five percent. So this was done. This is done a couple of years ago. Uh, it's, it's actually improved a bit. So you can see here we've got some um, regional models. So um, we, we need to understand that some areas of the world we've got good quality data. So uh, if, uh, this Irish group that's just come out is really, really robust survey across the, um, uh, well, the whole of that area. But other areas, um, so Indian Ocean, there's almost no data. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we need to understand where our data is good and where our data is bad. Well, I think good or bad, but just what sort of resolution? Another thing we need to think about, this applies to the, the, the terrestrial environment as much as the marine, is that we can um, derive uh, data, we can derive layers ourselves. So if we have a good elevation of the symmetry data set, we can derive using any GIS things that might be important to us, slope, aspect. Terrain ruggedness. Terrain ruggedness is important for um, a lot of benthic organisms. It might be a proxy for the rockiness of the, the, the seabed or the amount of um, sedimentation. Okay. And we can also derive other things that might be important distance to coastline. Um, and this might be a proxy for other variables or it might be a direct importance. Okay. So we can calculate um, slope uh, and other things. Um, so that's the uh, topographic data. So um, we're moving on to um, water column measurement data. Okay. So here um, we're talking about things like temperature. So uh, um, the one project of World Ocean Data Base collects data from um, buoys covered um, around lots of, of the ocean where they're directly measuring temperature or or other um, factors as uh, oxygen levels. And uh, the World Ocean Atlas takes these data and interpolates between them to produce uh, a series of depth tiered layers. So we've got a grid at the surface, we've got a grid at uh, 10 meters down, and uh, at different depth levels. So we've got a stacked set of, of grid, gridded data for these sort of data sets. And we've also got, um, from different sources, we've got measures of um, uh, alkalinity, or um, um, uh, carbon dioxide concentration, which can be used to derive um, um, pH. Okay. So ocean acidification um, is a big issue for marine environments. Many organisms uh, are dependent on um, 
calcium carbonate for the formation of their shells and skeletons. And so there's a lot of work to looking at the impact of ocean acidification, the other consequence of um, uh, rising CO2 emissions. And uh, uh, if we want to think about um, constraints on where organisms can grow, um, this is a really important one. Um, so another different kind of uh, data, not directly measured, but well, yeah, it's directly measured from um, satellites. There's a lot of there's a lot of data um, from uh, uh, satellite based on um, the color of the water surface, um, and the um, satellites, um, global satellite networks, uh, have been recording data. Since the late 90s, they've been sort of recorded um, lots of data on temperature and uh, other things. Uh, and this data is available, um, it's really available to download from global data sets. Um, they use for terrestrial environments as well. Um, but it's good data on um, temperature. They've just started to. Um, uh, Look at salinity, so we've got a couple of years of salinity, we've got 10 years of good temperature data, almost at a daily, on a daily basis. This is about two and a half to um, five minutes resolution. Uh, there could be issues with this sort of data because the um, polar regions don't have as good satellite coverage, and so uh, I was looking at some data for the UK and uh, Basically, the Scotland isn't covered very well by this in the winter months. Um, we have to uh, keep that sort of in mind. And we're looking at a uh, uh, really relatively coarse resolution, so two and a half to five minutes. So that's ten times uh, coarser than, say, the 30 second um, uh, elevation of uh, the territory grids. I didn't have a separate slide on this, but another really important thing that you can get from um, um, satellite data is some measures of primary productivity. And you know, this is this is uh, one of um, the biotic um, variables that um, Rob was talking about earlier. Primary productivity is really important for the ecosystem, yeah? um, and is um, obviously a driver of many species. And this can be measured by uh, uh, chlorophyll A. It's essentially looking for green areas. Um, this is a uh, model of growing productivity based on chlorophyll A. And it's also um, a particular inorganic and organic particle that you can get from these data sets. Again, these, are, they, these can be really important in determining distributions. So another um, different um, kind of data set we can get from marine environments are oceanographic models. So these are not based on direct measurements. These are ocean circulation models that try to re reconstruct current speed and direction, again, on a three-dimensional basis. And so what you can get with these, with these um, layers are a series of tiers, tiered grids that show current speed, current direction uh, in three dimensions. Okay. Um, there are some global models, uh, and these are again relatively coarse from a sort of uh, in comparison to um, uh, uh, terrestrial data sets. So you can get global models on uh, 30 odd minutes. Um, you can get regional models, but these these models are incredibly computationally expensive. We're thinking about the um, we're talking about the uh, climate models that are really trying to measure surface temperature. But here we've got three dimensions, so um, they're really really computationally expensive to, to run. Um, but they can be really important to uh, determining um, species. Uh, this is a this is a graph of um, around uh, South Georgia, um, and you can 
Yeah, there are some. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure so much about the availability of future projections for ocean circulation models, but the the future climate projections actually have embedded in them very coarse global circulation models because the the, the um, as uh, current circulation models, ocean circulation models, are really important in distributing heat around uh, the globe. So uh, the, the famous example is um, uh, the um, Gulf Stream. And Britain is, uh, for our degree of latitude, we're really warm. We don't get the sort of cold temperatures that you get in Europe because the Gulf Stream basically brings up all of this warm water from the tropics and sticks it in the northeast Atlantic. That makes a much more um, model here. So if that's if that if that goes to the off, the yeah. expectation is that we'd be really cold and we need to find some new hats. Um, but that example means that you know it's really important in the distribution of temperature around the globe. So these future climate models actually have embedded in, in the ocean circulation. Uh, another thing that, uh, important uh, is uh, uh, the, the substrata. So uh, again, this is this the, this sort of data tends to be classification data. So this is rocky seabed. This is soft sediment seabed. And the classification goes a little bit um, more complicated than that. And there's a, there's a reasonable classification, depending on who you ask, for uh, European waters based on the units. Um, in this project, uh, this is the classification around the UK. Uh, this kind of data is different from all of the other data sets we've been talking about so far. Everything else has been continuous data. So, temperature, okay, well, it's measured on a continuous scale. Uh, Point two, measured on a continuous scale. But this kind of um, uh, substrate data and the lab is soil data. This is classification data, so it's either rocky or it's sandy, and that's not expressed as a continuous variable. And so, if we're going to, if, if this is important for our organism, we need to we need to realise that this is a thematically different kind of environmental variable, and that has implications for how we can model. And again, uh, uh, just as uh, for the uh, terrestrial environments, we need to consider human impact when we're looking at green environments. Uh, there's there's really really significant impacts on um, marine distribution from human impact um, pollution. We can think about um, shipping routes. We can think about fishing fishing impacts. There's a really dramatic effect on distribution. Uh, this is a packaged human impact index um, that got published in science a few years ago, where the red areas show the most heavily impacted and the green is the least impacted areas. And so this is this is an important consideration when we're trying to make Okay, um, and so. Just like for terrestrial environments, there are a large, large, large number of potential variables that we can consider when we're um, trying to develop a model. So this is uh, a report I wrote recently on uh, uh, um, trying to model sea distribution in the UK. Uh, I've tried to list everything that's available for UK data at a reasonable resolution. This is a subset. So there's a lot, a lot of data out there. 
the, perhaps the difference between the, the, the marine and the terrestrial is that for the terrestrial there's a lot of pre-packaged data sets that you can just download and start using and that's great. For the marine data you've got to do a little bit more hard work to get your layers. Um, that said, there are a couple of pre-packaged um, data sets, like the equivalent of WorldClean or Climate, that are available for the marine, um, the marine environment. So Aquamaps um, is, quite, um, is quite old now. It's one of the first um, big, large churn species distribution um, uh, uh, model projects uh, that tries to actually model the distribution of thousands of marine uh, organisms. Um, relatively close uh, and more recently there's this project called BioOracle which are a, basically a combination of the World Ocean uh, Database um, direct measurements of uh, temperature and the MODIS um, CWIS satellite data that, use, uh, that, that also gives you uh, temperature and productivity. Okay. Um, the thing that you notice about this is that the resolution for these global layers, five arc minutes, that's ten times the um, dimensions of the 30 second run of data that is available for the terrestrial environments. Uh, and I think that's it. Yeah. So the thing that the thing that I like to point out when I'm talking about environmental data is that we're, we're all biologists. Um, I hope, well, we're, we're probably all biologists. And that means that we're not geographers, we're not climatologists, we're not oceanographers. And, and that means that you know, we, we don't necessarily fully understand how all of these data layers are made. And, and that means we need to spend some time trying to get to know and understand what they are before we can start using them properly. Right? Um, understand what's going on to make these layers, and that's going to help us interpret the results that we get. Um, what, um, what annoys me when I review papers is I see that people have taken a couple of different data sets and done some Mickey Mouse interpolation. Yeah, and I'm thinking, okay, we well, are biologists, trying to figure out the biology and, and try not to make, you know, try not to, try not to make oceanographic statements that you don't understand. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So get some, get some help. <laughs> yeah, that very good. Okay, so um, we should, we should do some questions now.